So this morning we're going to talk about Herman Bavink, who many of you may not have heard of. He's not as well known as most of the other fellows we've been discussing. But, um, oh, and I, I guess if you were coming here expecting to see Luke, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we had to, uh, we had to change up the schedule a little bit because I'll be traveling in two weeks uh, when I was intending to teach on Van Til. So we'll do Bavink today, Lord willing, Van Til next week, and then Voss uh, the, the last week of the class, which Luke will be teaching. Uh, so it's not too, too far out of order. Um, Herman Bavink was a theologian in the Netherlands. We'll look at his life a little bit, as you see on your outline. Um, you can see from the dates, 1854 to 1921, he was almost an exact contemporary of Warfield. Warfield was born in 1851 and also died in 1921. Very interesting in God's providence, Abraham Kuyper, Benjamin Warfield, and Herman Bavink all died within about six months of each other. Uh, Kuiper died in, in November of 1920, and then uh, Bavink and Warfield died in, 19, in the first half of 1921. And those were, I would say, without any doubt, the three most influential conservative theologians alive at the time. So it's just sort of interesting that uh, they were really very much contemporaries. Um, the, the reading that I recommended there in your outline is an abridged version of Bavink's main work, which is this Reformed Dogmatics. This is volume one. It's a four-volume uh, dogmatics set, and it's just been translated into English in the last few years. I think the first volume was translated in 2003, and the fourth volume has just been translated in 2008. And this year, they're releasing a one-volume abridged version of this, which I, obviously, since it's not out yet, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I expect it to be outstanding. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the dogmatics later. Uh, that sh it, it's said it will be available in June of, of this year, so uh, look for that. Uh, Herman Bavink's father was a very well-known, well-loved, and gifted pastor in the Separatist Church in the Netherlands. So in the, um, in the early 1800s, the, the church in the Netherlands was the state church. And uh, as you might imagine, the doctrinal standards, the, the quality of the preaching, and really the gospel itself had completely fallen by the wayside in the state church. So that um, in the, the 20s and 30s, there was a group that started splitting off called the separatists in the Dutch church. And uh, Herman's father, John, was a pastor in the separatist church when it was still illegal to preach. Now, as far as I know, he never went to prison, but his mentor, John's mentor, and another pastor in the Separatist Church had been in prison seven or eight times for preaching uh, outside the authorization of the state church. So that was, that was the, the, the family that, that Herman grew up in. His parents lost five children, including a 24-year-old son. And you remember uh, that John Owen also lost a lot of children, but... You can imagine the effect that, that has on a family. Um, John Bavink was an interesting character. He was extremely indecisive. Uh, just one sort of interesting, I think a kind of funny anecdote. He, he had a lot of trouble making big decisions. And the, 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 the separatist church, after it was made legal, started a seminary in a city called Campen. And John... Bavink was appointed to be one of the first couple of professors in the new seminary, but he, had, he was also had a thriving pastoral ministry. So he couldn't decide. For a couple of weeks, he couldn't make up his mind about whether he was going to take this call to the seminary or not. So he finally decided by casting lots. He, he wrote a letter of acceptance and sealed it in an envelope, and then he wrote a letter declining the appointment and sealed it in an envelope, and he gave them both to his assistant and said, mail one of these. And he, so he didn't know what the result was going to be. He ended up, uh, so he ended up declining the appointment to the seminary, uh, which, which <laughs> incidentally was not what his wife, his wife wanted him to accept the appointment, but he, he declined it by casting lots. And actually, this characteristic is also seen in Herman's life to some extent. He had seven or eight different times while he was a professor in camp, and he was appointed to the Free University uh, in Amsterdam, which was a much more prestigious university, 
and seven or eight times over the course of, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, he would get appointed, he would indicate that he wanted to move, and, and several times accepted the appointment, and then backed out a few months before. So, so the family was, that was an interesting trait, of even a very godly family, sort of, you see things like that. Um, the Bobbing family was good friends of the Voss family, and we're going to uh, hear about Voss, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. Herman's father and, and uh, uh, Gerhardus Voss's father grew up together. They were childhood friends, and they both started ministry in the same church at the same time. So the, the families were very close. Uh, Herman Bovink was born in 1854, as I mentioned, and um, he was very successful academically as a young man, although his father notes that when he was young, his father thought that Herman might not be very successful academically, uh, although his biographer thinks that he might have been kind of, uh, I don't know, sort of stretching things a little bit there. Um, so he skipped his first year of gymnasium, which I think is, it was three years and is equivalent, roughly equivalent to our high school. He, he skipped his first year and finished the next two years in one year. So he basically completed three years of high school in one year. And then he went off to seminary to study at Campen, which was the official seminary of the separatist denomination. It was a very small seminary. And after he had not been there very long, he decided to, he made a decision to transfer to Leiden, which was a big, prestigious, but also very liberal, theologically liberal seminary. And it was actually a big scandal in the denomination. He was heavily criticized for that decision, even as a young man, because uh, you know, it was a very small denomination. It was seen as he was leaving the denomination seminary to go off to this theologically liberal seminary. Um, but he wanted the academic rigor. He wanted to face the, the theological liberals face on and hear wh what they were saying and writing. So that's why he made that decision. And in his diary about that decision, he wrote, Shall I remain in the faith? God grant it. So he realized that it was a dangerous place to go and a very serious decision, but he, he ended up uh, doing his, his graduate studies at Leiden. Um, after seminary, he was a pastor for one year and had a, a very, very popular as a preacher. Um, and his, whenever he preached throughout his life, the churches were always full and it would be standing room only. He was very popular as a preacher. Um, but after one year, he accepted the call to be a professor at the, the theological seminary in Campen, where he was for just about 20 years, from 1883 until 1902. And you remember that um, Warfield became professor at Princeton in 1886, and Voss became professor at Princeton in 1894. So these guys were, uh, their careers were really closely overlapped. Uh, Bavink was also very popular as a professor at the seminary. One of the times where he had tentatively accepted the call to the free university, the students wrote a petition, which all of them signed. Every single student signed this petition asking him not to leave. And when he decided afterwards to decline the appointment, they wanted to have a big parade and a party, which the faculty didn't allow them to do, but they, he really was very popular. Um, He was, there was, there was a later split from the state church, another split led by, mainly by Abraham Kuyper called the Dolianti. I don't know if I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but something like that. And Kuyper and Bavink were instrumental in merging the Dolianti with the separatists, those two uh, denominations that had come out of the state church. Um, in 1891, he married his wife, Johanna, or Hanny, as, as he called her, and they had one daughter together. In 1902, after almost 20 years, finally, Kuiper and the others prevailed upon him to leave the theological seminary in Campen and go to Amsterdam, to the Free University in Amsterdam. Now, this was a, a major blow to the seminary in Campen, and that was part of the reason Bavink, for so many years, was very reluctant to do it. It was a small seminary, and he loved that seminary, and he knew that when he left, it was going to be uh, a major blow to the seminary. 
27 out of 50 students left with him and went to, uh, to, to the university in Amsterdam. So you can imagine that uh, because he was, he was v very well known, very popular. He was internationally renowned as a scholar, very prestigious. So for such a small seminary to lose someone of his caliber uh, was, was, was unfortunate for the seminary. Um, but it did probably turn out to be the best for, uh, for the church and for Bavink as well. So he was a professor at Kuiper's Free University in 1902, starting in 1902 until his, uh, his death. In 1908, he went to the United States uh, with his wife for the second time to deliver the very prestigious stone lectures at Princeton Seminary. And um, during his trips to the States, he stayed with the Voss family in, in Michigan and uh, got to travel around the United States a little bit. There are some I thought pretty interesting notes from his diary about his impressions of the United States a hundred years ago. Um, while he was in Michigan, he got to tra they got to travel from Grand Rapids to Holland by car, and I guess they had they'd never been in a car before, so he, he thought that was worth noting in his diary. Uh, when he was in Washington, D.C., he was able to meet Teddy Roosevelt for about ten minutes, and the thing he thought was most interesting about Roosevelt is that he said he acted like a regular citizen. He, he was just seemed to be like a, a normal guy. Um, they found Americans were very hospitable, but they found them to be superficial and not frugal. Now, by Dutch standards, they're not frugal. Um, he said he said in his diary, what one American family lived on would support three European families. Uh, so he thought there was a lot of waste in the United States. He was shocked at the lack of manners of children. And it says he objected most of all that almost all Christian parents sent their children to government schools to be educated by secularists at all levels. No effort was afoot to provide Christian education as far as he was concerned uh, from what he observed. So that was in 1908. Um, in 1909, his father, John, died at the age of 83. In 1911, Herman was elected to the Dutch Parliament the higher house of the Dutch parliament, which would be equivalent to the United States Senate here. Um, he did not campaign. He was completely surprised by his election. And almost as soon as he got there, he was elected president of the, the, that legislative branch. So, um, so he was also quite involved, quite influential in politics as well as in, uh, in, in the theological world. His major work, the Reform Dogmatics that I mentioned, was um, the first volume was published in 1895, and the final volume was published just before he left Campen in 1902. What's interesting is he never revised them. He, he after the first edition, there were there were um, many other reprints, but he never uh, revised the dogmatics because um, I guess he thought he had pretty much done what he wanted to the first time, and he moved on to other uh, topics. In 1921, as I said, he, he passed away, went home to be with the Lord after a long and difficult illness. Um, and so that's sort of a quick summary of his life. In terms of his works, as I said, the, his, his most important work for sure is the Reform Dogmatics um, in four volumes. The first volume, which I have here, is called Prolegomena. This is uh, the introduction. It also talks about the history and literature of dogmatics, talks about the principles or method of dogmatics, then it talks about uh, revelation, both general revelation and special revelation, and the last section is on faith. The second volume is on God and creation, uh, so how we know God, the person of God, the names of God, and also the works of God, and then the creation of God, heaven and earth, and then man is the image of God. Uh, the third volume is on sin and salvation in Christ. So he deals with sin and the fall. Then he deals with the person and the work of Christ and the salvation that Christ uh, acquires for us. And then the fourth volume, he deals with the Holy Spirit, the church, and the new creation. So that's, that's what's in the Reform Dogmatics, uh, and that's how it's structured. He has another book uh, recently published called Essays on Religion, Science, and Society, which I haven't read, but I... I uh, intend to get to it before too long. Uh, 
And then a book I have read is called The Philosophy of Revelation. And that is uh, the stone lectures that he gave in Princeton were translated and published as a book in the United States called The Philosophy of Revelation. And what this book is about is the meaning and the significance of revelation in a number of different fields of human study. So he looks at history, he looks at psychology, he looks at theology, he looks at philosophy, and shows how God's revelation impacts those areas of study. And basically shows that if scholars take uh, an immanentistic principle, so if they take a principle uh, that, that's, that's strictly in the world and they ignore God's revelation, then they end up making nonsense out of those fields of study. So that was a very, I enjoyed that book very much. In fact, I, I, I think it's probably one of the, from my point of view, one of the most important books I've read in the last five or ten years. Um, and it's interesting that Voss translated that book. Gerhardus Voss translated the philosophy of Revelation. Now, and, and the reason that's significant is because Voss was an internationally known world-class scholar at Princeton. If you know anything about world-class scholars in the humanities, they don't translate other people's stuff. Their graduate students do that. So the fact that Voss took the time and trouble to translate this book, uh, and, and then he and Warfield together oversaw its publication, uh, shows how important they thought it was. Okay, so now I want to get into the, the theology a little bit. And the, the first thing, and probably what's going to end up being the main thing that I want to talk about, is Bavinck's treatment of theological method. Now, as if you've been here before, you know that I've been talking uh, a bit about method in some of the other classes. And what we mean by method when we talk about theological method is mainly how do we do theology? How do we do dogmatics? What is the source of theology? What is the, the source of theological truth? How do we evaluate uh, what, what's uh, given by different theologians and so forth? So that's the idea of method. And to review, um, and, and that's, that's really the first major section in the dogmatics is Bavinck's treatment on method because you have to establish how you're going to do theology before you start doing any theology. And then the second section is the doctrine of Scripture. So if you're clever, you may be able to guess what his answer to the... Uh, the question of method is. Um, so to review, in three classes I've taught, I've been critical of some of the guy's method. You remember Thomas Aquinas, Roman Catholic theologian, before, before there was, uh, when there was just the Roman Catholic Church, but the preeminent theologian of Roman Catholicism. He took scripture as a source, as an authority, and as the highest authority, no doubt about it. Uh, Thomas Aquinas took scripture as the highest authority. But he also took the church fathers as an authority. And he also took pagan philosophy as an authority. So where scripture contradicted the church fathers or pagan philosophy, then he would hold the scripture. But if scripture did not openly contradict those things, then he would take those sources as authoritative. The church fathers and especially Aristotle as an unbelieving philosopher. So what happens under that method is uh, you, you get all sorts of things in theology that are not derivable from Scripture uh, but come from these other sources. And then the, the second problem uh, with Thomas Aquinas and, and the medieval church is their interpretation of Scripture. So how they deal with Scripture itself, they use, he relies heavily on the allegorical method and secondly, he takes the interpretation of the church fathers as authoritative. So if the, the Bible text says one thing and the church fathers have interpreted it a certain way, now that becomes fixed and entrenched in the, the theology of the church. Luther rejects the, uh, the other sources. He says sola scriptura, scripture alone. But what Luther ends up doing is he finds this scriptural, biblical doctrine of justification by faith, and he makes that really the highest criterion of theology so that, um, for instance, he, he says that the, gospel of, or, or the, the epistle of James is an epistle of straw. 
because he doesn't see justification by faith alone in the epistle of James. So he takes, he, he, he rejects the pagan philosophers and he rejects the church fathers as authorities, but he takes one aspect of scripture and elevates it above all the others. Um, you see, I, the way I was thinking about this, Luther said scripture alone. The reformers said scripture alone. Does that make sense? I think, I think that's the idea. That Luther rejected all the other authorities, but he really didn't end up fully doing justice to the scripture itself, and he ended up with a sort of one-sided look at the work of Christ. Warfield, remember we talked about last week, um, was inconsistent with his principles. Warfield recognized that God's revelation in Scripture is objective, clear, and inescapable. But he incorrectly affirmed that the unbeliever could use right reason when the unbeliever approached the Scripture. So um, Warfield believes that the, the unbeliever can correctly interpret God's revelation. However, the unbeliever doesn't accept God's revelation as true. The unbeliever wants to appeal to supposedly neutral facts and neutral evidence. And since uh, Warfield accepts those premises of the unbeliever, he ends up with, especially in his doctrine of Scripture, that the claims of Christianity are only highly probable. Now, he says, of course, that they're very, very highly probable, but still, because of his method, he has to, he's forced to the conclusion that the claims of God in the Bible are only highly probable. So, with that as background, um, I, I wrote a lot, of, uh, a lot of quotes in the notes this morning, and I'm actually going to probably read most of these because Bobbing is such an outstanding communicator. As I was reading these quotes and putting them together, I, I was thinking, I can't, I mean, usually I would read a quote and then kind of explain it, but uh, I think you'll see that I just, I can't improve upon, upon most of these quotes. So, um, he starts out by saying, dogmatics is, is the established truth of the knowledge of God. So, it's, it's the truth concerning the knowledge of God, and uh, he gives three sources. Um, that's okay, I don't have a marker, but... He says there, there are three possible sources for dogmatics. The first is Holy Scripture, of course, that everyone accepts. The second is the witness of the church and or the confession of the church. And the third is Christian consciousness. So the experience or the subjective beliefs of the Christian believer. So I, let's read quote number one on your outline. He says... By the method of dogmatics, broadly speaking, one must understand the manner, thanks Luke, one must understand the manner in which dogmatic material is acquired and treated. Three factors come into play in this acquisition. Holy Scripture, the church's confession, and Christian consciousness. Depending on whether or not any one of these factors is used, overestimated, or underestimated, and how it is positioned in a modified relation to the remaining two, the starting point of dogmatics as well as its development and content will differ. So we have Scripture, the Church's Confession, and the Christian Consciousness. And Bobbing says, not only will the source, depending on how you, which of these you accept and how you weight them in relation to one another, not only does the source of dogmatics change, but the content of dogmatics changes. And you can see that in Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas takes this one, but he also takes this one. And so you get purgatory. Uh, well, I'm just, I'm going to read Bobbing's quotes because he says it better than I can. Yeah, oh. The Christian consciousness, it would be that um, 
as a, as a Christian, as a believer, I've trusted in Christ, I've been born again by the grace of God and so forth, um, can I look within myself and uh, acquire any truths about Christian theology? That's the question. Uh, it's, it's basically um, a matter of, of uh, looking at the human subject as a source of, of theological truth. Does, does that make sense? Um, so he's in the, the next two quotes I have, he's going to address these two here. In quote number two, he's, he's going to address the church's confession. He says, Apostolic origin cannot be proven of a single dogma the Catholic Church confesses outside of and apart from Scripture. Rome's doctrine of tradition serves only to justify Rome's deviations from Scripture and the Apostles. Mariolatry, the seven sacraments, papal infallibility, etc., are the dogmas that cannot survive without tradition. At an evil hour, the apostolic tradition was equated with ecclesiastical customs and papal decisions. Tradition, in the case of Rome, says Harnack, is common superstition, paganism. So Bobbing looks at this. He says, what we've got, is we've got these traditions in the church, we've got these pronouncements of the popes, and they're, they're elevated to a so-called apostolic tradition. But that cannot be proved. There's no proof that the apostles taught any of these things. But they're accepted that way in the church, and it becomes part of, of dogma. So Bavink rejects the church's confession as a source of theological truth. Now he comes to the Christian consciousness, and this is a, is a powerful quote. Listen to what he says in quote number three. He says, in none of the 12 articles of faith, and he's talking here about the Apostles' Creed, in none of the 12 articles of faith can I believe be replaced by I experience. That God is the creator of heaven and earth, that Christ is God's only begotten Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, are things that cannot, in the nature of the case, be experienced. Although there certainly are effects in the church, that directly proceed from its glorified head in heaven, that Christ arose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of God, are things we know only from Holy Scripture. Our heart can most certainly bear witness to all these facts and experience their power, but as facts, they are firmly established to our mind only by the testimony of the apostles. So all the main doctrines of the Christian faith they don't come from within us. We can't generate those truths. They come from God's revelation in Scripture. So Bavink rejects the Christian consciousness as a source of Christian theology. Now, he's not saying that the church's confession is not valuable and important or that Christian consciousness is not valuable and important. But he's saying these things cannot be a source of theological truth in the church of Christ. Are there any questions about that in terms of the source? Yeah, Rob. Well, it's certainly a rejection of... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Rob said that he, uh, he assumes that in rejecting number three, that that assumes or implies a rejection of anything to do with Pentecostalism. Certainly, in the sense that Pentecostalism, as much as I understand, uh, relies heavily on ongoing revelation, especially within the heart of the, the individual believer. It's a firm rejection of, of anything like that, for sure. Are there any other questions about the, the source of, of theological truth in Bavink? Okay, so he's established Scripture as the only valid source of theological truth in dogmatics. And he says, because this is God's Word, it is above all other authorities. Um, so I want to read uh, the, the next two quotes, number four and five. He says, not the church, but scripture is self-authenticating, the judge of controversies and its own interpreter. Nothing may be put on a level with scripture. Church, confession, tradition, 
all must be ordered and adjusted by it and submit themselves to it. Now here's where he talks a little bit about the value and the place of, of church confessions. He says, The Reformed, though deeming a confession a necessity in this dispensation of the church in order to explain the word of God, to turn aside heresies, and to maintain the unity of the faith, denied with the utmost emphasis that the confession had any authority apart from Scripture. Scripture alone is the norm and rule of faith and life. Then in number five he says, For dogmatics is a positive science, gets all its material from revelation, and does not have the right to modify or expand that content by speculation apart from that revelation. So he's rejecting any speculation and he's saying that the scripture, because it is God's word, is the highest authority and every other claimed authority uh, must be subservient to it. And so you see already this is a modification of what we saw in Warfield because Warfield says the scripture has to be tested against facts and against evidence. And Bobbing saying, no, the scripture is self-authenticating and self-interpreting. Um, The other very, very important result, which is also uh, an, an adjustment to Warfield, is that because of this, because uh, Scripture is God's Word, and because we are fallen and sinful creatures, theological truth can only be, be apprehended from the standpoint of faith. Um, so let's read quote number six. This is very important. To say that dogmatics is the system of the knowledge of God serves to cut off all autonomous speculation. It is to say that God cannot be known by us apart from his revelation and that the knowledge of him we aim at in dogmatics can only be a transcript of the knowledge God has revealed concerning himself in his word. However, if the revelation contains such a knowledge of God, it can also be thought through scientifically and gathered up in a system. And so there's the, the, the task of dogmatics. In that activity, the dogmatician remains bound to the revelation from beginning to end and cannot bring forth new truth. In his activity as thinker, he can only reproduce the truth God has granted. And then here's the key point. And because revelation is of such a nature that it can only be truly accepted and appropriated by a saving faith, it is absolutely imperative that the dogmatician be active as believer, not only in the beginning, but also in the continuation and at the end of his work. So the, the theologian has to be a Christian. He, they, they, we cannot interpret God's word rightly if we are not coming from the standpoint of personal faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so you see, that's a modification for Moorfield. Warfield wants to have theological truth that can be evaluated equally by unbeliever and by believer alike. He sees the, the use of reason as a neutral tool by which any person can correctly evaluate God's revelation in Scripture. Bavink says no, because human beings, Christians and non-Christians alike, are fallen and sinful. We have to come to theology from the standpoint of a personal faith in Christ. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, Luke. Yeah, did everyone hear Luke's comment? I hope so. Just saying that uh, this isn't just true for academic theologians, but it's, it's equally true in our day-to-day -day lives as Christians. We, we have to take our starting point in God's Word, and we have to come to God's Word from the standpoint of, of faith in Christ. So, as a result of this approach, what was historically done, both in Roman Catholic theology and in Protestant theology, of saying that apologetics, or the defense of the faith, precedes dogmatics or theology, that that approach is not valid. See, that's what Warfield wants to do. He wants to say, well, first, we need to establish the truth of the Bible on the basis of neutral facts and evidence, 
everyone, believer and unbeliever alike, can accept. That's the tax, task of apologetics, to establish the truth of the Bible. And then, once we've independently established the truth of the Bible, then we begin the task of doing theology and seeing what the Bible teaches and how it's to be applied. Bobbing says, if we do this, if we subject God's word to criteria of our own devising, then we've already, in principle, rejected his word as the highest authority. Um, so I want to, and I want to read uh, quotes number seven and eight. Number seven, he says, placing apologetics at the head of all other theological disciplines, as this occurs in Schleiermacher and others, is explicable only from the fact that these theologians no longer recognized theology's own principles and were forced to look elsewhere for a foundation on which the building of theology could rest. If, however, theology is deduced from its own source, that is, from revelation, it has its own certainty and does not need the corroboration of philosophical reasoning. Accordingly, apologetics cannot and may not precede dogmatics, but presupposes dogma. So the defense of the faith presupposes the faith that it's defending. And we'll talk about that more, Lord willing, next week when we get to Van Til. Then in number eight, he says, if Christian revelation, which presupposes the darkness and error of unspiritual humanity, submitted in advance to the judgments of reason, it would by that token contradict itself. It would thereby place itself before a tribunal whose jurisdiction it at first denied. And having once recognized the authority of reason on the level of first principles, it could no longer oppose that authority in the articles of faith. You get that? Does that make sense? He's saying, the Bible says that we are fallen human beings and that the, the human mind, the fallen mind, is at enmity with God. So if the Bible would subject itself in, in the beginning to the judgment, or as he says, the tribunal of the fallen human consciousness, it would contradict itself from the beginning because the Bible comes to us as the highest authority and not something that we can say, well, let me see if I approve of what I find here. Let me see if what God's word says uh, stands up to my criterion of what is what is right and what is... Yeah, Rob. Uh, the New Thought Movement. I'm not familiar with it. it is. Well, rationalism, I would... I mean, I, I, as Bobbing points out, even in the history of the church, I mean, this is definitely the case in Warfield, that he wants... Because of his, his theory of knowledge... He wants to put autonomous human reason as the foundation for first establishing the truth of the Bible. Are there any other questions about that? Yeah, Greg. Yeah, because he, because he already rejected... This is, the church's confession is not revelation, nor is the, the witness of the Christian consciousness. So Greg's saying uh, that he seems, in his opinion, that Christian apologetics is going more in this direction that Bob Inc. outlines of, of showing that autonomous reason uh, doesn't get you very far, that you have to assume scriptures. Is that correct? Um, for sure, there is a significant movement within the church in that direction, and it's um, mainly, in my, in my opinion, Founded by Van Til and really given the the full statement by Van Til and his uh, his students, um, but it, it, to some extent it's it's uh, it's rather debated. Um, but I think within the Reformed Church there's a there's a fairly strong consensus that this is how apologetics should be done. Luke, yeah, does everyone hear what Luke said? It'd be hard for me to repeat that. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, go ahead. Right. So I, 
and, and Warfield, Bobink, all these guys, Van Til, all agree on that. The evidence is absolutely compelling and clear and inescapable. The evidence for Christianity. The, the question is, can human beings correctly interpret that evidence apart from the standpoint of faith? So a, a good example, what Van Til talked about a lot is, and I think and Bobink does as well, Jesus Christ, we say Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that can be, uh, there, there's overwhelming evidence for that historically, but so what? So what if the guy rose from the dead? What does it mean? We don't know what, and I talked about this last week, so you remember, what, we don't know what, what the fact of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead means apart from the meaning given to the fact in God's revelation of Scripture. So, yeah, Margaret. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Did everyone hear what Margaret said that... Um, Bavink saying, to do, theologi- to do theology correctly, we have to be humble and submit ourselves to God as the creator. Um, so we, we did get some questions in there, but we're out of time. So unfortunately, I'm not going to get to the last point, but uh, hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that tied together some loose ends that we've been talking about through the class. So let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, this class that we had today. Thank you for the discussion and the, and the excellent questions and comments. Lord, we pray that as we assimilate this material into our lives, that we would indeed come before you as Christians from the standpoint of a humble faith, knowing that you are the creator and we are creatures, that your mind is ultimate, and ours are not, that your truth is definitive and that everything we think and do must be in subjection to what you have revealed in your word. Lord, it's much easier said than done, but we know that by your Holy Spirit, you give us the power to live before you in holiness and godliness and obedience to your law and that you not only do that, but you transform our minds into the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we pray that we would be about that business as your children. And we pray that you would bless us as we enter into your presence for worship now. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for all that he did for us in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and now in his ascension, seated at your right hand. We pray that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus, and we ask these things in your name. Amen.